Hello again everyone. How's it going? I'm making this video from my bedroom because, uh, well, because nobody's here. Usually my kids and my wife and everybody's in the house and I can't generally, you know, it's not very quiet. So I make them in the back office or outside if I can. But um, since they're all out at uh, their other grandma's house, I figured I'd make a video from the bedroom to show that I don't just live in a cave, I guess. Really because it's a good spot. But anyhow, get to the point instead of rambling like I do so often. But just so you know, the, the rambling at the beginning of my videos, it gets me into what I'm going to say. If I had written down everything I'm going to say in the video, then it, you know, I'd be able to start out and just say what I'm going to say. Or if I'd been doing a lot of takes, but, you know, I make them all at once. So think of it as like a warm-up before you exercise. And uh, I'll tell you, speaking is a damn exercise. It's draining. Thinking up things off the top of your head and being able to convey them are two totally different things. So, I've been toying with the idea of how to attack this video. Um, I just finished reading this book, Prometheus Rising, by Robert Anton Wilson, and I mentioned it the other night in the video I made. I wanted to finish it completely before I talked about it, and uh, I'll say for what it is, it's a phenomenal read. It's, it's nothing... At first, my thoughts were, it didn't introduce... It introduced many new ideas, or um, I should say new interpretations, within language of ideas. And I, what I mean by that is I, I see a lot of things in patterns, metaphors, in life. When I see something happen and I compare it to other things, and everything to me is cycles and patterns. And I still have to hold myself in this world of language to be able to decipher and confer what I'm trying to say to people, but you get to a point where you really just can't anymore and on certain things. And when it comes to issues of improving your mind or trying to go deeper, it seems that there are a couple diff two different camps. There's one camp of people who believe that you can manifest your destiny, who you can change your mind, you can improve your life, and then others who are maybe miserable and just say, well, there's nothing you can do. We're all at the mercy of fate, and if your life sucks, it sucks. And trying to convince someone uh, like that, with that mindset, that no, all you have to do is change your mind, that's impossible. And that's kind of what this book tackled, was why people are so impossible to convince of something. And not saying that you know what's true or right, but just to propose an idea that things may be differently. There are certain primal triggers that everyone has that, and if you want to break them down, I'm not going to, this was based on an eightfold model of consciousness, the first four being the lower and the last four being somewhat higher or metaphysical. But my thought is this, that we're basically, we have the mother-daddy issue, we have the tit obsession, the, the suckling, our oral fixations. Um, we also have the uh, what we perceive to be value uh, as far as what we've grown up with in our lives and what we've been shown. And But the biggest circuit or the biggest problem that we have as far as trying to move forward as human beings into a more peaceful or uh, I guess peaceful world would be there seems to be this idea that we are war, warring creatures, and uh, that we are always at war and we will always compete. And I've bought into this for a period of time, but I no longer believe that. I really don't lo any longer believe that humans are just by nature going to be violent. Uh, I believe that there will always be people who are sociopathic, there will always be some people who want to take more than their share. But the issue isn't how many of those people exist, but rather, do we feed their egos? In today's world, if you're greedy, if you're selfish, that's considered something to look up to. And uh, not by all, but by a large amount of people. They see a successful person and they elect them president, or <laughs> the president of their company, or whatever it may be. And we're stuck with a lot of people out there who are stuck in that primal circuit of territory. And the easiest way to convince people that what you're saying is true is to tell them that they're in danger, that they're threatened, whether it be terrorism or immigration or from their own people. And one of the greatest things that, that people in charge can do is to convince the people that their neighbors are their enemies. And basically, divide and conquer is a term that we all know well, and this is what's happening in a lot of countries and now in the United States. And what we're doing is dividing ourselves among value lines that are based in extremes, what we think the other side is like. In fact, I had a comment earlier, uh, somebody left on one of my videos just pertaining to that, that said, uh, 
has said that the problem that we have right now is that we're divided into two camps. Those who want to open, who want to let everybody come into the country and our baby killers, and those who are not. And I found that to be the ultimate fallacy. Here we're saying everyone else is a baby killer, everyone else wants to open the borders, and this is how we get into this territorial dispute about life, about values. So uh, there's not much I can say. You know, uh, I'd like to read some parts of the book, and, and I have a lot I'd like to say, but it's very hard to convey. It's kind of like this. If, if people, if you can't get past the primal circuits of the way people think, then you'll never be able to get through to them. And even if you do, who's to say that getting through to them is something that you should be doing? You should have, we all have the belief that what we think is right to an extent, that our values are worthy. And if not, then we wouldn't believe them. But we all know that the ones that cause conflict are generally our ideas of what life is, of what territory is, um, borders, all these different things. And the idea, can we live in a utopia? Or will we always be forced into this scary world that we've created of our own making? And I believe that in those primal needs, you know, the fight or flight, you know, symptoms, all of this is based in our primal needs to survive. But now we've moved past this. You know, there's no reason to feel threatened and scared all the time. We don't always have to think somebody's out to get us. The reason we do feel that way is because we're allowing it to happen. Because we think that that's just the way things are. So I'm going to go ahead and just read some of the, a couple of the things that I took notes on, or rather the ones that I, uh, I highlighted a few things on here, and uh, so this is in, uh, I'll just go right into it here, because there's a ton of stuff that I would have liked to speak, but just a few here. Um, we're t right here we're talking about evolutionary stages in humanity. It says, uh, also on the right track, okay, Henry's brother Brooks was looking for laws in history. Brooks observed a pattern, which may or may not be entirely true but is as approximately true as the similar generalizations of Vaco, Hegel, others, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Every civilization, Brooks Adam proposed, goes through four stages. One, the monopolization of knowledge by priests. Example given, the Egyptian priests kept written language a secret among themselves, as did the Mayan priests. And this is happening, you know, uh, knowledge has always been kept from the people. This is where we're at. We're believing that the people who we hire to represent us, that it's okay that they hide from us. And that's, <laughs> that's a problem. But number two, the monopolization of military power by conquerors who made themselves states or governments. Um, lands on the shores of England with a superior technology, warriors on horse versus native warriors on foot, and he becomes king. His relatives and sycophants become lords of the land. Number three, the monopolization of the land by these landlords, the extraction of tribute or rent from those who live on the land. And number four, the monopolization of the issue of currency by national banks, the extraction of tribute or interest for each piece of currency put into circulation. These may seem like very basic things, and they are, but we really have to realize this is where we get to the idea of do we need a, this large of a military? Do we really need to invade this land? And where do we really stand as a people? Who deserves what type of attitude? Um, I'm going to go just move on. Um, <clears throat> all ideas are not equally good, of course. All manifested ideas, human creations in the biosphere, are therefore not equally good. This is why John Ruskin, a century ago, tried to introduce a distinction between wealth and ilf. The distinction did not become accepted. Uh, okay, so it says the ilf was perceived as necessary to protect the wealth. So in other words, we have wealth, which are the, by definition, they're saying that the wealth are things that were created by human mind. I think that there was something in here that defined that, but I'm not sure where it was. But uh, wealth are things that's created by our consciousness and intelligence. And ilf are things that we need to protect those. Guns, bombs, and... Uh, you know, we, <laughs> well, don't need to say much about that. It's just a terminology. And then there's a little side note here. A human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, design a building, con a ship, write a sonnet, balance accounts, write a wall, set a, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve an equation, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly, Specialization is for insects. 
I completely relate to that. Um, I'm kind of a jack of all trades, master of none, and when you meet a specialist, you know, they may scoff at that idea, but uh, we're not designed to be specialists. We are conscious thinking beings. That's just my opinion, but... So I'm going to go ahead and read this uh, page, and I don't know how much of it... Make sure the camera's going, yeah. Um, this will be the last one. Okay. It's talking about ch rearing children and uh, imprinting. Um, I'll just start here. Similarly, class structure, like the caste structure of an insect hive, works to produce the right imprints in each class. The third circuit of the servile class, or proletariat, is imprinted chiefly for manual dexterity, while the same circuit in middle class or ruling class children is imprinted for verbal, mathematical, or other symbol using skills. Democracy has been less than a total success, and the intellectual's half-shamed cynicism about democracy is justified, to the extent that traditional society did not need, could not use, and in many ways discouraged the development of high verbal or rational skills in the majority of the population. That is, concretely, most people are not encouraged to be very smart, and are rather heavily programmed to be comparatively stupid. Such programming is what's needed to fit them into the most traditional jobs. Their biosurvival circuitry works as well as that of most animals. Their emotional territorial circuitry is typically primate, and they have little third circuit mind to verbalize or rationalize with. And these are the folks who get frustrated because they can't convey what they're trying to say, as we all do, but the less verbal skills you have, the harder it is to communicate with people, and therefore a person becomes frustrated and leans towards groups that are more like him. Naturally, they use vote. They usually vote for the charlatans, who can activate the primit primitive biosurvival fears and territorial or patriotic pugnacity, which I think we've all seen happen plenty. The intellectual looks at the dismal results and continues to believe in democracy only by an act of blind faith similar to the way beliefs in Catholicism or communism or snake worship are maintained. Again, in the traditional, si the traditional system works for traditional society. A mass made of people who have intense curiosity about why Beethoven went in for string quartets after the Ninth Symphony, or whether Kant really re refuted Hume satisfactorily, or what the latest quantum theories mean in relation to determinism and free will, is not a mass that will easily be led into dull, dehumanizing labor at traditional jobs. And I'll skip ahead here. Similarly, the moralist, or the adult personality who has imprinted heavy ethical imperatives on Circuit 4, is often totally unable to communicate with the scientist or technologist. The moralist may even decide, many already have, that the scientist per se is inhuman. In fact, morals are fairly irrelevant to the Third Circuit analytical mind, which is the brain functions the average scientist has imprinted most powerfully. To the Third Circuit, the only morality is accuracy. The only morality is sloppy thinking. And I think it's just fantastic. You know, the idea of imprinting in the book is, you know, we... We know that kids are imprinted at a certain time. You have to teach them to do certain things, or else they may not be as, as good at it, so to speak. Um, it's well known that teaching kids languages when they're young is easier. This has to do with neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the way that our brains make connections, and their synapses will uh, they will slow the speed of connections. They're, they're much easily rewired when we're young, and this is natural because kids are still a blank slate for the most part. But the thing is, people say, well, we've learned all these bad behaviors, and it's true. But not all of the behaviors are learned. And this is the idea that fight or flight may be a genetic, uh, something that's passed on genetically. Uh, we might think that we've learned, well, we almost got in an accident, and we, you know, or somebody almost hit us and we jumped away from it. We'd say, well, that's because we learned not to get hit. But when you talk about things like suckling, like a baby knows how to suckle a tit. Why? because it's programmed to do so. And so the question becomes, how much are we programmed to do? And the only way to really know this with humans is to look at feral children. And there have been quite a few cases, but not enough to really go on. But uh, they, know how, they know how to watch out for themselves. They understand fear. You will learn these basic programs, no matter whether you're raised by humans, wolves, or bears. But when it comes to using, when you use your mind as far as language and verbal skills, 
you're overwriting the existing program in a lot of ways. This is how, why practicing meditation, it's not about thinking anything or doing anything, it's about, it's like turning your computer off for a while to let it cool down, or um, maybe rather kind of reformatting, you know. It, it's a matter of, uh, once we quiet our mind where we can allow understanding to take hold, things that we never knew we would know come to mind. I can't quiet my mind as easy as I'd like to, nor do I have much time to do so. I mean, with kids and a life, I've got, you know, a, generally a noisy lifestyle. But I still take the time to think about what the world, <laughs> um, where we could be as a species, as people. You know, um, a lot of people, as soon as they see somebody who has a pipe dream about the future, they're just like, oh, you're ridiculous, you can't, we can't change it, it's just the way it is, and I say bullshit. Um, one thing that I could to convey before I go here is they were talking about scientists and how scientists um, generally won't change if they have an existing paradigm. They won't break that until the next generation. Even if they have a new proof, new evidence, they tend to hang on to those old ways of thinking. It's not until the next generation of scientists come in that they can compare the new and the old and have, you know, an open and honest non-biased view. Because a person who was raised to believe that this is a fact in science, no matter how open-minded they are, is going to have a difficult time changing their mind, because that's a protective feature. Um, if we just say, the greatest wisdom lies in knowing we know nothing, that doesn't really help us, because we still have to know something. So, knowing nothing basically just means that having a blank slate and opening up and just saying, we're not sure, we don't know, but we do know that there is a potential for people to be better. And I've seen it. I've seen it in myself and in other people. I know that a person could be frustrated, angry, and upset, and depressed, anxious, and take on an Eastern type of philosophy or, or a meditation or even something as simple as breathing techniques, which is crucial. And uh, no, you're not going to change your mentality within a day, not even within a week, but within a week to a month to a year. Gradually, you'll find your mentality shifting to where you won't be lashing out at people who attack you. You won't feed into the trolls and scream at them, fuck you. You won't be too upset when you're confronted with somebody who disputes your views. And that's the most crucial. Because if we really stand behind what we believe, we don't get frustrated with others who don't agree. Sometimes that can be difficult when you're trying to convey that something is true that's endangering people, and a person says, well, no, that's not true. Or a person thinks that something is endangering people that doesn't exist, or many of the conspiracy theories and delusions out there. Um, we want to yearn for something greater as, as humans, and sometimes we latch on to whatever comes our way. And that's why it's important to clean the slate and start over. So, um, I would say, I'd recommend this book uh, to anybody who you know, is interested in these different circuits. There was a list of them uh, I was going to read out just so you could see where it was kind of coming from, but uh, I couldn't seem to find it. It was just like all the different, um, all the different circuits. There's, oh, here we go. So number one is the oral bio survival circuit. This is imprinted by the mother or the first mothering object. And, you know, what's fascinating is that there have been stories of uh, there's a story of uh, a giraffe who was born, and the first thing that, that the giraffe saw was the jeep of people who were, you know, there watching it be born. And it imprinted the jeep as its mother, and it actually went on to follow jeeps around. It has four wheels, looks close enough. Um, when the giraffe was old enough, it even tried to mate, I guess, with this jeep. This is how heavily we're imprinted when we're young, and why it's so crucial. Um... The second one is the anal emotional circuit, and that's about the toddler stages. Um, this is the territorial circuit. The third one is the time binding semantic circuit. Um, it handles and packages the environment, classifying everything. Number four is the moral social sexual circuit, uh, which tells you what's right and wrong. And this comes usually during puberty. Uh, and the last four, there's the uh, number five is the holistic neurosomatic circuit. Number six is the collective neurogenic genetic circuit, number seven is the metaprogramming circuit, and number eight is the non-local quantum circuit. So I won't even get into the details on those. You can check it out if you want. And uh, so that was my ramble, and I hope you all have a fantastic day.
Talk to you soon. Peace.